Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome back to the California Book Club. Um, it's very, we've got a very exciting program tonight uh, with Claudia Rankin um, discussing her, um, her essential book, Citizen, um, in conversation with California Book Club host John Freeman and our special guest, Helga Davis. Before we get to, um, before we get to the interview, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the California Book Club and Alta Journal. I'm the books editor of Alta Journal. Um, Alta Journal is a quarterly magazine published out of San Francisco with a active, very active web presence um, about California history, California culture, um, and California literature. Uh, the book club grew out of an essay that was published in the magazine by John Freeman um, about the new California canon. And every month we welcome a California writer to discuss an iconic and essential work of contemporary California literature. As I mentioned, tonight's guest is Claudia Rankin and the book that we'll be discussing is, um, is Citizen. Before, uh, before again, before, I'd like to explain the book club uh, and our partners, the California Book Club's monthly events and continuous content leading up to each book club meeting are always free. If you haven't had the chance to check it out, you, you'll definitely want to. There are essays from numerous contributors with reflections on the, the work under consideration, essays related to, uh, to that work. There's an excerpt of Citizen and other, um, other, other features. All of this is included in our weekly California Book Club newsletter, so which is also free, so sign up. Um, and take a look and come come visit with us every month while, as we discuss um, as we discuss California literature. We couldn't do this without our partners, so I want to take a moment to acknowledge them. Uh, they are, excuse me, Book Passage, Book Soup, Books Inc., Bookshop, Bookshop West Portal, Diesel a Bookstore, Green Apple Books, the Huntington USC Institute on California and the West, the Los Angeles Public Library. The San Francisco Public Library, Narrative Magazine, Roman's Bookstore, and Ziziva. Um, and a special congratulations to Oscar Villon, who is the uh, one of our selection committee members who has just been named the new editor of Ziziva Magazine. Um, I, you know, if you want to think about how you can help support the work that we're doing, bringing in-depth articles, essays, and interviews with authors and poets like Claudia Rankin to you, well, there are a couple of options. There's always a sale for the California Book Club members for $50. You'll get a year of Alta Journal, a California Book Club hat, and Alta's newly published guide to the best bookstores in the West, the first book that Alta has produced. Um, and you, if you can find out more about that at altaonline.com slash join or watch tomorrow's thank you email for a link uh, to the deal. You can also join Alta as a digital member for $3 a month. Um, all of these options are good options and, um, and, 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 and you'll be reading some amazing work. Um, in any case, it's a thrill tonight to, uh, it really is a thrill tonight to welcome um, Claudia Rankin. I'm a huge admirer of this book um, and of her and her work. And so without further ado, let me introduce my colleague, John Freeman, to start the proceedings. John? Thank you, David. Thank you, everyone, from, for coming from New Orleans, Homer, Alaska, from where I lived for a while in downtown Carmichael. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with Helga Davis and Claudia Rankin to be talking tonight about Citizen. Uh, the point of this book club, among others, in terms of sharing what we felt were great books written in or about or from or by Californians, was also to look at books breaking new ground. Um, the word canon can sound contentious, except when you realize, hopefully, the best of it is to allow us a, a container for the complexity of existence. And the canon often needs updating because existence changes. And uh, uh, the last 20 years have been heavily mediated in our lives, as in not only has American life continued, but we've also watched it continuing. We've watched ourselves continuing and suffering. And one of the extraordinary things about Claudia Rankin's work um, is not only the way that she has found a new mode in collaging poetry, uh, interviews, found uh, documentary uh, recordings uh, of caps uh, encapsulating a reality that is driven um, often through uh, racist means. She's she's also in a, in a trilogy that began with uh, don't Let Me Be Lonely, which is also subtitled an American Lyric, 
Citizen, the book we're going to be talking about tonight, and her most recent um, nonfiction and poetry work, Just Us, she's managed to find a way to talk about uh, whiteness and racial difference um, and the ways that American life has created films of suffering um, and what it means to live within those uh, as a white person, as a black person. Uh, the poems in Citizen are beautiful. Uh, they have extraordinary lines. Uh, the images that she has in there are uh, beautiful and disturbing. Um, and the stories that come through the whole book in second person sometimes are instantly affecting because they're told in the second person. And as a result, as a reader, you have to decide whether you are the you who is having these experiences where something has been said, which is a microaggression and makes you, the listener, hyper visible. Uh, it's an extraordinary book. I'm so pleased to have her with us tonight to talk about it, how she wrote it, um, and where she is going with her work now. Please join me in welcoming Claudia Ranking. Hi, John. It's so nice to be here with you. It's nice to be here with you, too. Um, uh, I want to start with just the, the really basic question about the word citizen. It's it's appears 150 pages into the book. Um, it's a very bold statement to put that at the, at the heart of the book. When did you realize that this would be, book would be called citizen and why citizen? Um, all my books begin with the title Danger, Will Robinson, but <laughs> I have many files in my computer. I never know which book it is because they're all called Danger, Will Robinson. Um, but I was at a tennis match and um, there was the huge cameras and um, Serena and Victoria Azarenka were playing at the US Open final and it was being sponsored by Citizen Bank. And, and I thought, that's it. That's the title, Citizen. So how did uh, this book, as I tried to describe, um, it brings together poetry. Uh, there are um, situational second person essays in which uh, a speaker is describing interactions with people in which uh, they, she, or he, uh, become hyper visible as a result of interaction based on racial assumptions. Uh, there are what could be described as found poems or scripts for situation videos that you make with John Lu uh, Lucas, um, one of which is composed of all things said during the CNN coverage of Katrina. Um, uh, orchestrating this is, it must have been a, a, a fantastic and extremely um, difficult task. And so I, I sort of want to know where did the project fully begin? Was it through talking to friends? Were you taking notes? Was there a poem or a lyric that began? The, the project actually began with the situation videos. The very first piece written was written um, based on those CNN interviews. I was watching, I was living at the time in Houston and we were watching the, um, the coverage. And it was one of those weird things where weeks before they were talking about the levee breaking and that it was located in um, communities of color and that they would all, and then it was, and then the, the storm came and you thought, why are they not evacuating those neighborhoods? Because they have told us they're gonna be underwater. And, and then it happened and then Katrina happened. And we had been taping with no purpose. I don't know why we were taping it, but we were taping it. And um, so that was the, the very first one. And they, it organically grew out of that um, because that was, um, that was a huge event, but I got very tired of people saying to me, and you know, excuse me, but mostly white people saying to me, how did this happen? How could something like this happen in the United States? And, and I thought, when did America start caring about black people? 
what planet do you live on? And so I wanted to build a trajectory where those very people who were asking, how did this happen? In their day-to-day -day lives, were saying some of the most egregious things to people of color and to show how that builds into, it's the very same trajectory that arrives you at a police killing or um, Katrina. The parts of the book where you're pulling from conversations with friends um, or uh, you're recording interactions in second person, um, how many of those were based on your experience versus uh, experiences that you had described to you? Obviously, later in the book, you've talked to a friend who's a lawyer who's frequently pulled over by the police anytime there's an APB for a black man who's committed a crime allegedly committed a crime. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what, when, when you're what writing in second person, is that always you? No, um, many of the, I interviewed, or I don't know if interviewed is the right word, but I had conversations with people. Yeah, right. sorry, I keep using the word interview and that's a terrible <laughs> word. <laughs> but I, you know, I simply asked them, can you tell me a time when you were doing something ordinary in your day, in your life, and suddenly somebody said or did something that rerouted you. And it rerouted you most many times emotionally. It, you know, it pulled you out of one mood into another. It paused you. You understood the comment was only happening because of your skin color. And, um, and so many of the stories were told to me multiple times but the one that ended up in the book ended up because of the way it was told. Um, you know, like many people talked about being um, not being seen and somebody cutting in front of them in line. And, you know, sometimes you think, well, everybody's been cut, but they would say, well, this time I knew it was because, but then a woman told me a story, a friend of mine told me a story. She actually, who lives in, in um, Los Angeles and, um, or she lives in Southern California. And, um, and she told it in the way that it appears in the book that the, the guy cut in front of her, the woman at the counter said, sir, she's standing right there, she's next. And then he turned to her and said, um, um, I didn't see you. And she says to him, you must be in a hurry. And he says to her, no, I just didn't see you. And, and I was fascinated by the fact that she would have said to him, you must be in a hurry. I kept thinking, why say that to somebody? in that situation, because you could think of a lot of things you could say. And, and it occurred to me that she was giving him an out. She was giving him an excuse. Like we can all be in a hurry and just blindly move forward. And he was like, no, 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 I didn't see you. <laughs> and so that's, it's that telling that would have ended up. So I was listening not only for the, the moments themselves, but for how they were told. And as you can see, I can say it from memory because I remember very distinctly when she told it to me. The, obviously the opening piece about being in, um, in um, grammar school was my experience. And that was because I was trying to think of a time, the first time it occurred to me that someone was saying something based on my race. And there's a, a piece that has to do with going to see a film um, that belongs to me. But many of the others came from these conversations I had. So in, in many ways, this book written by, orchestrated by, arranged by uh, you is also a, a deeply collaborative book in the nature of how it portrays experience. I think it, that's in a way why it has um, been embraced by so many in our community because they recognize either, not themselves in a one-to-one -one way, 
but their experiences that that we all share. Slightly different, slightly um, maybe a different thing was said, but it is that. And I don't think I would have been able to communicate the vastness of the experiences if I were just pulling from myself. When you decide to read from the book, do you ever, um, has, has the book all become part of you? Or when you are reading from different sections of the book, do you, are you occasionally remembering the person who told you um, what you read? Yes, I, I am. And and some some of those people have, <laughs> I had one friend who said, someone called her up and said, um, I read this book by Claudia Rankin, and in it, something happens that happened to you. <laughs> and the person was like, yeah, because I told her about it. <laughs> yeah. So what would you read for us tonight? Um, I'm very curious. Well, tonight I thought I would read um, a more meditative section rather than the, the pieces that um, live in um, episodes. So I will do that now. The world is wrong. You can't put the past behind you. It's buried in you. It's turned your flesh into its own cover. Not everything remembered is useful, but it all comes from the world to be stored in you. Who did what to whom on which day? Who said that? She said, what? What did she just do? Did she really just say that? He said, what? What did she do? Did I hear what I think I heard? Did that just come out of my mouth, his mouth, your mouth? Do you remember when you sighed? Memory is a tough place. You were there. If this is not the truth, it is also not a lie. There are benefits for being, to being without nostalgia. Certainly nostalgia and being without nostalgia relieve the past sitting here. There are no memories to remember, just the ball going back and forth, stored up by this external net. The problem is not one of a lack of memories. The problem is simply a lack, a lack before, during, and after. The chin and your cheek fit into the palm of your hand. Feeling better? The ball isn't being returned. Someone is approaching the umpire. Someone is upset now. You fumble around for the remote to cancel mute. The player says something and the formable, formable Formerly, formerly professional umpire looks down from her high chair as if regarding an unreasonable child, a small animal. The commentator wonders if the player will be able to put, put this incident aside. No one can get behind the feeling that caused a pause in the match, not even the player trying to put her feelings behind her, dumping the ball after ball into the net. Though you can retire with an injury, you can't walk away because you feel bad. Feel good, feel better, move forward, let it go. Come on, come on, come on. In due time, the ball is going back and forth over the net. Now the sound can be turned back down. Your fingers cover your eyes, press them deep into, your, into their sockets. Too much commotion, too much for a head remembering to ache. Move on, let it go, come on. Thank you so much for that reading. And uh, the end of alphabet, uh, you're looking very closely at how language breaks down under pressure. Um, sometimes pressure on the body, uh, pressure as in the, in the form of an illness. And I, I wanted to talk to you about writing the body in Citizen 
in the wake of an illness and how that affected your sense of what a poetic line was and, and how to use language about the body. Um, well, I think um, when I was working on Citizen, I had been diagnosed with cancer and then was in treatment. Um, so it's interesting working on a book when you think um, anything could happen, that it could be, you know, the, the end of, of all of that. Um, and it could be goodbye to all that. And um, so it seemed like the perfect time actually to look at the way one feels about what the body can hold in, in a certain way. It, I mean, you know, there's a way of looking at citizen as something that is concerned with the too muchness of life and, and that African-Americans have been asked to carry more than they can carry. And that has, um, and white people have been asked to be in service of the killing of other people as part of their dailiness. And, and both, both positions should be untenable for all the bodies, you know, in a certain way. I mean, when you think about the, the, the kid who was shot in the head by the guy when he tried to pick up his, his siblings or the, the white woman who was shot, um, you might, when she turned around in the, um, in the driveway, both of those situations are situations where suddenly the body seems not to matter and then to seem only to matter. You know, like these people are like, we don't want those, anybody, anybody approaching our body. <laughs> and it's, it's a really interesting place that we've arrived in. Yeah, it's astonishing, uh, especially when you consider both of those arrivals should be greeted by some form of hospitality rather than mm -hmm. instant hostility. Exactly. Someone comes to your door, hello. You know, someone pulls into your driveway. Oh, you look lost. And instead, uh, in both cases, the, the response is the lethal or attempted lethal violence. And for, I think for African-Americans that whether you're on the scale of an insult that's coming out of them, you know, somebody else's mouth or a gun, um, it's still the same thing. It's still uh, the feeling of the body not mattering in any way, form, and being asked to, to hold violence, actually. Mm -hmm. I would like to bring in Helga Davis, who is a multidisciplinary artist and vocalist, um, but is also the ho host of the podcast Helga, which is hosted by WNYC. It's in its fifth season and incredibly impressive for any podcast these days. And she also has a one hour interview with Claudia Ranking on there. So if you do not get enough Claudia Ranking tonight, which I probably think you will not, you can go over to Helga's podcast, but Helga, come on now and, and um, join us and, and take a look. I am here. Hey, you. Hey, how are you? All our favorite history won't instill insight won't turn a body conscious, won't make that look in the eyes say yes, though there is nothing to solve, even as each moment is an answer. And I wanted to start reading you back to yourself because there's something very interesting that happened in the beginning of this conversation that John was speaking about breaking new ground and how the container changes. And I cannot help but feel in this moment that the new ground is the ground, is the same ground. It has always been here. And that the container changing, okay, but the container is still a container. And there is nothing about either of those two things that is serving us 
as a society and that is serving us as citizens. And so I'm wondering if you would talk about that a bit. About the, yeah, I mean, I, you Particularly know, coming from, from this, which you've already said it, and, and yeah. here we are again. And here we are again, and, and here we are again. You know, uh, it's, it's I'm, I'm always sort of at odds with myself around, because another way of thinking about this question, you know, the, the horrible question that everybody asked that you're not asking, but that's in there is, can we be hopeful when we are constantly being um, confronted with the same, 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 sameness of samenesses. Um, and we can argue about 1619 at the beginning of enslavement, or we can argue about, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's like the, the, the devaluation, the dehumanization, all of that um, continues. And it continues not just, it's gotten to the point now where um, you have enough black people dehumanizing black people as you have um, the institutions of, of white supremacy and whiteness doing the job that it was set up to do. Um, so it's, and yet, is there change? There is some change. I think there is change and, but, the question, the real question is, it's not about hope, is where the change lives. You know, like where, where is it not just the same, same? And I, I, and that's a question that sort of I've been thinking about and where can we look not for solutions, not for, um, a way for us to stop thinking about these questions because they remain active and alive and dead at the same time, you know? And I really think there, I have to say, I think it is in the, the, the culture. The culture has continues to do its job as a force that keeps certain parts of the population resisting what seems to be inevitable. Mm -hmm. And so the resisting has stayed. And that, as long as you can keep that going, I think that that is as alive as we get in a way. Um, but does it, does it mean that change, a change is gonna come? <laughs> no, I don't think so. <laughs> I, I, I agree with you. I mean, someone asked me that recently. I was stopped by a Columbia student on the street who was asking people, asking strangers questions about love. And she asked me, uh, do I believe in love for our society? And I just said, no, I think, I think it's ridiculous. And that these are the questions that keep us in this place of hope and that keep us wrapped up in, in what is not the question. Mm -hmm. um, and this idea to really just look and know and accept that this is crap here. Uh, I don't think it's, it's about making the community understand or any of that. Yeah. It is what work are you doing right where you're standing, mm -hmm. right there. Exactly. And, and in we, proximity and in relation to the person next to you. Yes. You know, because that I think we have some control over. How Agreed. I treat you, I have some control over that. Yes. Um, and that I think you know, civility is gone the way of something. But, <laughs> but I, I still think one-to-one -one we have control. I, you know, Brian Stevenson always says, start proximate. Mm -hmm. And um, that man I think is incredible in living his own advice. 
you know, in terms of what he's done. Um, in, um, and those of you who haven't read Just Mercy, I say read Just Mercy. Um, so yeah, I, I, yeah. But I, I don't, I don't want, you know, I don't want to be a Debbie Downer in that I, I do think, you know, you and I have a lot of good times. And sure. so there is a, there is a life to be lived, but, um, but how much power do we have inside all of this? I think there is a kind of powerlessness that we have had to negotiate as black women all our lives. John, will you come back and join a bit of this part of the discussion? Absolutely. Uh, um, Helga, thank Do you. And we'll, we'll bring you back in the, in the latter part of the hour as well. Great, um, thank you. I, I, I'm curious about, um, in the middle of the, the book, uh, Citizen, um, the, the word you begins to repeat and acquire th this really interesting sonic quality mm -hmm. where it is sometimes it feels like a repetition and sometimes it feels like a different you. Um, and the, the culmination of this sequence ends with, no, it's a strange beach. Each body is a strange beach. And if you let in the excess emotion, you will recall the Atlantic Ocean breaking on our heads. And it's this in incredible three lines. And the, the, the book is constantly sliding away from conclusions um, towards bigger questions. Um, and sometimes it, it slides towards an, an image. And that image of the Atlantic Ocean breaking on our heads, not your heads, my heads, our heads. Can you talk to us a little, little bit about that image and how, how it arrived? and what it has come to mean you know you've probably read this line a few times <laughs> in the last nine years and and how people have received it well i don't know how people receive it but certainly i was one of the things that i tried to do in citizen and probably the hardest part of writing it was how do you get the language to be transparent and still hold all of the history so it meant um, trying to get each word to do all the work it could do in terms of um, the Atlantic slave trade, in terms of police shootings, in terms of, and to bring it into a kind of ordinary vernacular that um, as, as Yeats says, all the stitching and unstitching would be for naught if it doesn't seem a moment's thought. But so this, like, how do you take and make something very simple, but not simple, not simple. Yeah, simple, but not simple. And that was the, um, and it, it meant a lot of crossing and a lot of ego. Like, am I writing just, just to say I know it? Take it out. Am I using this word just because I have it as part of my vocabulary? Take it out. If we can get it to be that the reader can just drop through the language into the um, into the flow of 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 what it's communicating, then you've achieved it. So that line had to do with that. It had to do with bringing in history. Um, in the way of, of, you know, this thing is bashing me on my head. <laughs> this thing is, 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 is hitting us all, hitting us all. And so it, that was the, um, and I, I do think it succeeded in that moment. Staying on the word you, there's a, a question from an audience member who says the part of the book that you read is the part that she loves the most. Uh, a, a local artist, uh, um, uh, Amina Robinson, believed the African concept of Sankofa, understanding the past so that we can learn from its joys and mistakes. Mm -hmm. The question is, do you think the past that is buried in you, quote unquote you, uh, a negative force? No, is no. It it's, I mean, it is our history. It's, it's, it's history. It can, it's, it's, does it have 
brutality and um, enslavement and um, betrayal and sadness, yes. Does it also have family and intimacy and secession? Yes, <laughs> you know, it's, so it's, it's all of that. It's, it's everything that we are. And, you know, um, Paul Salon said, what, what, what is it when a conversation has turned into a, a fight? And I, I feel like that's what has happened. Like the, the inability of two races to coexist in the same space, partly because one was forcibly brought here, but um, nonetheless, um, has been the struggle of this nation. And, you know, and white people like to say, no, it's, it's economics, it's, but it's not. Those forces are there, economics are there, class struggle is there, gender, all of it. But at the end of the day, it's the inability of people to reduce themselves to their humanity, to their humanness, mm. and holding tight to this idea that they can only exist if they exist relationally and in a, in a position of superiority to somebody else. Is that what you mean in the line where you say, join me down here and nowhere? Exactly. Uh, the, 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 the rhyming and wordplay, I mean, that, that the section is sort of like you as a poet talking to yourself to some degree, kind of tried rhyme, tried truth, tried epistolary untruth, tried and tried. And it, it feels like you're sort of talking through the ways that you've tried to write towards the, of the failures of what you just described of, of, of people unable to relate without relations, relationality. Exactly. And, and I mean, I was thinking also in that section of Robert Lowell, um, somebody who came through the tradition was sort of knighted by T.S. Eliot as, as the next bard, the next poet. And um, and then had a breakdown, you know, talk about the body that had a breakdown and his um, shrink said to him, you know, write your life. And then he looked at the oppressiveness of this Brahmin life that he had come from as a white man and and everything that that carries with it, the supremacy. And I was looking at some of the early drafts of his poems and they had. Um, Black people in it that he took out in the final drafts. So he was describing scenes that included um, neighborhoods that were mixed, but when he published the final poems, those things were gone. Was this in for the Union Dead? Yeah. And so I, I so he was in the back of my mind uh, as I was writing that section. I was like, you know, join me in the nowhereness and maybe we can start again. Of course not, but, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and he's the one who, he took pieces of people's letters. So that idea of ep episcopalary on truth, I, he was criticized for um, using personal letters in his poems. I wanna ask you, um, because you just did laugh um, and laughter is a part of this book, but especially of just us, you know, it's sort of, it's, it's this force, like this kind of, that, it, that um, draws people together in a moment where they're playing roles that are absurd. And sometimes the absurdity reaches such a peak, you know, especially in Just Us, when you're, uh, the speaker, you are, are at an airport and a man cuts in front of you boldly, brazenly, and sort of, you have to laugh because it's such a, a, an extreme uh, demonstration of, of white male privilege. Mm -hmm. but. Can you talk about sort of using laughter as a literary device within works like these, which are trying to kind of destabilize really, really broken, but in intensely persistent narratives? Well, they, they function um, in part um, as release 
but but there's also a level of absurdity inside, as you mentioned, inside um, these moments that the true reaction, and as far as I'm concerned, is laughter. Because I think the comic relief of it is the recognition of the absurdity of it, and yet the power of it. So the two things coexist. I mean, that guy, for example, um, he is doing what comes naturally to him because he has been allowed to do it all his life. And, um, and you know, there is something very, I, I'm writing now about collapsing. That's my new thing. <laughs> and, um, and the reason I got there was because of Cory Booker when he was talking to Judge um, Justice Jackson now, but at the time Judge Jackson uh, during the, the confirmation hearings. And he said to her, you know, I can't stop any of this, this behavior that's going on, but I can talk to you. And then he laughs and he says, cause I'm so happy that you are here. That was and, a great moment. Yeah, wasn't that an amazing moment? And I, I think, I think that laughter he does in that in that incredible um, speech talk he gives, it, it's, it's a way of both recognizing the absurdity and the power that is coexisting um, and that she has to take during that for her to get what is next. And um, so I think for me, humor sort of functions like that. It doesn't take away the reality of the power, but it shows the absurdity. I'm very curious, the, the situation videos that are part of the book um, uh, are sometimes absurd, sometimes very disturbing. Um, and then I've seen some of them. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm curious how many don't make it into the into your books, but become just part of a, a natural process of reaction, and how you differentiate the two. You know, what is a what is a reaction to a spectacle? Uh, what is a, a what is a an artistic refraction of that spectacle? Is a reaction important to put within, you know, a work of art? Uh, I'm cur I'm curious how you feel about those things. Well, look, I mean, at the end of the day, the book has an arc. It has, you know, everything that's in there is there because it answers or performs, performs something in my mind in terms of the trajectory of the book. So what doesn't make it in was noteworthy to me to respond to and for John and I to respond to, but, um, but maybe I'm not writing the book where it lives. And so those still live only as themselves. Mm. Um, but were I to write a book where suddenly I think, oh, then, you know, because I think as, as a maker, you're constantly storing, you know, it's like, it's all it, but instead of being in closets and on shelves, it's either written down or it's up there in your visual or auditory menu. Yeah, so you must have an, inc an incredible visual memory um, for storing things as well as a, um, a sonic memory, as well as an eyesight memory. And that's an, a very unusual um, triple capacity because most people seems like they remember in, in one way. And I'm, I'm curious um, if, if you could talk a little bit about um, designing this book, you know, you, you, this is a John Lucas designed this book. Um, you've written the words and you've recorded some of the words and you've arranged them. And you've, you know, the paper, I assume is a very specific kind of paper so that the images and as a artist, this is an, an incredible degree of control and um, production. Um, it's, it, it has, it's like hanging your own gallery um, it, it show. And I, I wonder if this was the first time you ever had that much control over a certain work. And if there was any, 
argument you had to make on its behalf in order to have that level of control or or, or if gray wolf just said we you know this is great give us a file and we'll we'll print it well, I, when I was at Grove for End of the Alphabet and Plot, we designed the covers um, and they won awards for the covers, you know, because we knew what we were doing, I think. <laughs> and um, so John was, they called and said, John's cover has won an award. Um, so they allowed us to do that. And um, when I moved to Grey Wolf, um, with Don't Let Me Be Lonely, they redesigned what we sent them. And I called Jeff and I said, you know, Jeff, this won't work <laughs> for me because the, the choices I made in terms of the space on the page and the font, they, and the kind, and the, even the length of the book had to do with trying to mimic newspaper columns versus something else and they were incredibly once i explained why i need, made the choices that i made they very graciously reverted back to the original and mm. and then after that conversation then um citizen and um justice we we sent them the files and obviously there was conversation about um paper and costs and images and rights but ultimately there is not a thing in those books that didn't happen at our dining room table between john and me talking about what's possible that's you know i'll bring helga back in now um who made the point that you know this this device we call a container for stories, you know, hasn't changed a whole lot <laughs> in many degrees. Um, and, you know, I, I, I wonder if you can address, you know, there's a, it seems like there's a small story about the evolution of technology and its representation of suffering across these three books. Um, am, am I getting that wrong or is there, or no, no, have no. you seen I this mean, arc? The, yeah, I mean, I, you know, the, everything from, in some ways you could say, don't let me be lonely now seems very dated with its television screens and, um, and you know, so, and, and Just Us has a kind of um, reliance on social media and the ability to have many different, um, modes of information coming at you very quickly so it inform it you know you're right it has informed that the the re receivership capacity informed each book and your attempt in just us is to have a very old-fashioned <laughs> form of media which is a conversation and helga uh, i'll pass it to you as the curator of conversations if to see if there's something you would like to come back to or, or take forward that we've been talking about or any a new question of your own. I, I don't think I have a new question, but I do think another element of all of Claudia's work, which mimics the work that I do with my podcast and as a performer is, is this heightened sense too of listening and listening with the body, listening with the eyes, listening with, with the, you know, with the ears. It's such a, it's such an important uh, thing to become that, that could, should be facile at, for all of us, that we should be, we should, should, that's a hard word too. <laughs> that, it would benefit us as citizens to develop these abilities uh, and know that in doing so, we might change our minds about something. We might be able to intervene in a situation with, with our ability to listen. I think it's a big part of, of all Claudia's work. 
No, I agree. I mean, the white space was in the books was meant to allow um, for both thinking and time and hearing and seeing within one's own body. My mother, when she read the book, she's like, why is so much white space there? I'm like, if you can't use it, you can't know. <laughs> you know. There's a question, uh, there's this comment from, from the audience. Christy Chirano says, uh, love the white spaces. And after recently rereading House on Mango Street by Sandra Cisneros, I realized the power of the pause. Um, and th th that that is something also that you enact in, in ways that you retell the story of listening or this the story of a of an interaction is allowing for different forms of pauses, you know, sort of moments where the conversation could go one way, or in some of the interactions in just us, you and the person you're speaking with realize what's just happened and live with that um, interaction and then go a different way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it's almost like you're, you're enacting poetic meter <laughs> in person as a, as, as a listener, as a speaker. And I, do you ever feel when you're um, in interactions that are you just out as a person out in the world that this, aspect of your artistic life where you've narrated these experiences means that you have unfortunately accumulated more self-consciousness about how to be you or how to listen or does that fall away pretty quickly as soon as the zoom screens go down no i think you know i i i i i live in a world of vigilance you know i i came out of a very um a very, uh, I'm trying to think of the right word, but I, a childhood that was filled with erratic people, let's put it that way. And so as a child, I learned that for my own um, welfare, I really needed to pay attention to what was happening and who was at what point in their erratic behavior. So, um, and how to modulate that for my own safety. So I think that that has controlled the way I am in the world going forward. It was, you know, trial by fire. Um, but now I find it very restful to watch. I, I Sometimes I have to remind myself to go forward. You know, like sometimes I'm in my head thinking, why is that person doing that? Do they realize they've just you know, driven by our turn? And then they'll say to me, why didn't you tell me I was supposed to turn back there? And I, but I'm fascinated with sort of what they're doing. <laughs> I'm like, what are they doing? <laughs> but in fact, they're just spaced out, but whatever. But, you know, so, so it sometimes works not in a good way. But I just read this great book by um, Claire Keegan called um, small things like these. And it's in it, I, I've, I've learned that what I value when I'm reading is a writer's ability to stay in real time with me. And there's this lovely passage, I, I, I'm not gonna be a, spoil the, the narrative, but there's a way in which the protagonist he ends up doing something, but you don't know when he decided to do it. And that is something I've been thinking about a long time, like how she managed to get him there without me knowing he was going there. And so I went back and reread it because I wanted to see where the turn was. I'm still looking for it, but you know, that kind of thing fascinates me. Will you ever write narrative um, fiction? I mean, I, I know parts of um, parts of plot fall a little bit into narrative. Um, there, parts of all of your books operate like stories in some ways, but I, 
I guess what I'm asking is <laughs> because the novel used to mean new and sometimes it doesn't look very new anymore. Like what would a Claudia Rankine novel look like if were you to write one? Or and has have you ever contemplated? I don't I don't know if I could write fiction, but I do know that I love the fiction that I think is poetry. <laughs> so I love, for example, As I Lay Dying. I, I think that is stunning. I mean, if I were ever to be able to create something like that, I would be very pleased with myself. Um, I love um, Virginia Woolf's To the Lighthouse. Um, you know, there are sections of Toni Morrison's work that Sula or um, Parts of Beloved where you, you are reading unlineated um, poetry. Um, so, and some of the best writers, my favorite writers started out of, you know, as poets, Kutzia um, wrote poetry before he wrote prose. And you see it in a book like The Life and Times of Michael Kay. I mean, that, if that's not poetry, I don't know what it is. So, uh, so the answer is, if I could just take one of those books and put my name on it, <laughs> I would be very happy. Or Claire Keegan's Small Things Like These, actually. Are, are you still making um, more situation videos? You know, we haven't made um, one in a while. Um, and I don't know why that is, because one of the things I liked about working with John as two people who lived in the same household with different skills is that we could come together and make these things that weren't um, due. You know, nobody was waiting for them. We just made them. Um, but of late, I don't know if we were, I be, you know, we've both been busy on other projects who's been working on um, a lot of um, policing. Go he was in Europe at um, different um, prisons, looking at um, the Norwegian prisons versus the American prisons, things like that. And so we haven't really been on the same trajectory of like. When, um, when you collaborate together, uh, does, does it, does it always end up with um, you doing different parts of the, the same different parts of the project? Because it seems like in Citizen and you're often writing the scripts and the words and he's doing the filming, but have you ever chipped in to sort of bring in film clips yourself to say, hey, what if we use these? Is, is that sort of how the, I guess what I'm asking is how the collaboration actually breaks down. I mean, there is, there is, constant talking in terms of um no yes <laughs> maybe later uh i don't know i don't you know and even though we haven't made any situation videos there are certain moments that get stored so i'll say to john let's keep that let's ha you know something will happen I'll see it and I'll say, let's, let's hold on to that. We'll never, you know, you never know when. And at some point, um, I will need it. It will come back. It, it, it has started a conversation in my head and we'll pull it when we need it. So we have um, a kind of storehouse of things um, that, um, and, and I, I would have thought that during the pandemic, we, since we were both home, we would have done, but we didn't. Mm. Helga, you, you've worked um, in theater and are a performer. And, and, you know, a lot of times tonight and whenever I've heard you speak about your work, Claudia, you, 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 it's so clear that you have a background in and have written for theater um, and that you think in terms of the three dimensionality of the stage. And Helga, I'm, I'm curious um, if, in your conversation for that hour long podcast, which everyone can go and, and hear it at, uh, at Helga. Um, if, if talking to Claudia feels like talking to a director um, or if there's a different interaction 
that happens, not just because she's not your director, but because there's these other elements as, of her as a poet and her as an anthologist or as a professor, as a public intellectual. What has happened with me inside of Claudia's work is that it all feels like it belongs to me. All this language feels like it belongs to me. So anytime that I've read it in public or I've read it to myself out loud in my apartment, uh, that language belongs to a, a pace, a rhythm, a tone that belongs to me as a person and also belongs to me as a performer. And it's the kind of language that I can imagine a person just on a stage speaking back to an audience. I think it is that immediate and approachable, but it also requires something of you that maybe isn't spoken or written that has to do with how we sit as citizens, how we watch and how we gaze. And uh, it is, I hope that we will write something for me for the stage eventually. Why don't I just say that? <laughs> I mean, we worked together. We wrote, with, we wrote a piece together that Helga performed um, magnificently, actually. Um, so it and 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 we have plans for the future. <laughs> it is a really tantalizing place to, <laughs> to end and to encourage everyone to go to Helga and listen to an, uh, their conversation there. Um, I hate quoting Whitman here, but the, the, you know the the idea that a book can a person can contain multitudes has in your work achieved a whole new and I, I think beautiful and complex meaning um, with this book that's made of many voices and many registers um, and and all of them um, yours and and others. Um, thank you for this incredible gift, uh, a book of a decade, I think, um, if not more, and I think we will be living in its possibilities and its enlargements probably for the rest of our lives. Um, and so it's just an, an immense honor to talk to you and to spend this hour with you and um, for everyone who's come and asked questions and cheered from the sidelines, thank you. Um, Claudia Rankin, it was a real pleasure. Helga Davis, a pleasure as well. Thank um, you so much. Thank you, John, thank you. it's been a pleasure. Helga, as always. As, as always. always. I think David Eulen comes back now and walks us out. I, I, I am here. Thanks to all three of you for a remarkable conversation. John, Claudia, Helga, um, really wonderful. Lots to think about. Um, I do want to let it remind everybody that this interview has been recorded and will be available at CaliforniaBookClub.com. Um, I'd like to also remind everybody about next next month's book. I almost said next week's book, but next month's book uh, on, on May 18th, we will be uh, Percival Everett will be here to discuss his novel Telephone. Um, I'd like to let everyone who's in L.A. Um, know or anyone who's going to be at the Los Angeles Times Festival of Books this weekend, Saturday and Sunday, please come by the Alta booth, booth 111. Um, we have contributors, California Book Club uh, writers and other authors um, signing books. There's all kinds of stuff happening. So please come by. We would love to see you all in person. Um, reminder about the sale on the Alta membership for California Book Club members at altaonline.com slash join or the $3 digital membership. Please participate in a two-minute survey that will pop up as soon as this event ends. And stay safe, everybody, and see you all next month. Take it easy. Good night.